Okay, the big problem for me, and I suppose as a result for you, is um, two things. Firstly, as I said, the course is originally planned back in 1997 when I first taught it. It's pretty much designed for the needs of the preparatory year students in the history department. So I aim the course pretty much at a graduate level, but at a bunch of people who may or may not be doing, have done much history before. So I, I take that into account, okay? Uh, so if you find things difficult the rest of you, I'm not suggesting you would, maybe you're all uh, very familiar with uh, uh, his, history studies and so on, uh, you have to let me know. So the course is designed to give you some history, which is obviously what people from the history department need. Also, to kind of go over what I would call historical methodology, the way that historians do things. So a lot of things I'll be doing will be to help you learn that if you don't know already or acquire uh, some of that. And thirdly, kind of we'll do a little bit of what kind of skills graduate students need. Okay. So my only fear is some of the rest of you might think, well, why is he talking about graduate stuff? Why is he talking about these preparatory year people? We're all here as well. Uh, so I'm try I'll try not to do that too much, but I will be focusing primarily on the sort of uh, ultimate needs of the history students and where we're going with that. But there'll be hopefully plenty of other things that will uh, suit the rest of you. Okay, any questions so far? Anything not clear? All right, let's look at the syllabus then. And there is a, an online version uh, here. Uh, the worst thing about doing online versions is they always end up being different somehow. I forget to paste something in and things like that. So if you do see anything, if you ever look at, if you ever even go online and bother to look at this, uh, then you can let me know. Uh, I'm planning to make use of Moodle uh, for this course. Oh yes, I've got to say uh, no for that. We get a nice buyer tapestry there. I put in um, about a year ago. Uh, the people at the university who organized Moodle ran a few workshops and my wife went along and then she was saying how great it is and all the things you can do and I thought oh, I can probably do that so I tried to teach myself Moodle sort of quietly on my own so I'm not very good um, and okay, Alp we tried to use Moodle a bit last year but I, not many people used it but I'll, I'll try and work on it in the coming few weeks to make it a bit more uh, integrated for everyone and if you've got any feedback we can talk about that later on but I have put uh, a link to the online syllabus there. Should you be in Moodle, you can just jump to that page. You don't need to go searching for the long URL or whatever. And I have put, should you prefer to damage the Amazon rainforests, you can then, if you lose this, you can print uh, another copy from there as well. We'll have a, maybe have another little bit of look at Moodle later on. OK. so. What have we got here? The purpose of this course is to introduce the main developments in the history of Western Europe from the end of the Roman Empire, so that's kind of 4th century, uh, until the Renaissance, so that's round about 1500. Within the, a broadly chronological context, so roughly we'll be moving through time starting next week until the end of the course, within a broadly chronological context, we will examine the various political, religious, and social changes in the West, uh, which occurred during that period. So although it says medieval Europe, I won't be looking a lot at kind of Eastern Europe. It's pretty much kind of uh, the Western side of Europe, which is the traditional area, and it's the area I know more about. If you want to work on other parts of what I agree is Europe for your essays and things, then you can discuss that with me, okay? But we'll talk about that later. Okay, here are the uh, 13 topics. This is what we're going to be doing in the next um, 14 or so weeks. Starting next week, we shall look at the late Roman Empire and the what I'm calling the Germanic invasions. Um, the end of the Roman Empire and the arrival of people speaking uh, various kinds of Germanic languages, my Anglo-Saxon ancestors, for example, arriving in... Uh, uh, what is now uh, Western Europe and eventually kind of taking over and setting up something which becomes very different. So the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, which of course is the phrase from Gibbon, and the Germanic barbarians and what they were, we'll look at. Secondly, 
two weeks from now, uh, Rome's heirs, which in fact I've stolen that phrase from uh, a book by uh, Professor Rosamund Bakitarik in uh, Cambridge, of the barbarian kingdoms. What did the barbarian, the Germanic people set up? And we'll look particularly at the Merovingians in what's now France, uh, the Visigoths in Spain, and the Ostrogoths and Lombards in Italy. Uh, groups of Germanic people who set up their own kind of little kingdoms and so on. The following week, we shall look at Anglo-Saxon England. We'll find out what was going on in, in Britain, uh, the end of Roman Britain, the Anglo-Saxon invasions and the early kingdoms, and a bit about the Celts as well. Then we'll look at the, we'll have already mentioned a bit about uh, Christianity, but then we'll look at the uh, history of Christianity uh, in detail there. Early Christianity, origins of the papacy, and then a little bit about the origins of monasticism. What is monasticism? There's a question there. We know what the word monasticism are. What if, if you called someone or described something as monastic, what does that mean? It's a very important individual in medieval Europe. A monastery is a kind of a church, and why is it different from another kind of church? What makes it a monastery? What makes it different from other kinds of churches? What gives it its character? Why do we call this one a monastery, and this one we don't call it a monastery? Hmm? Uh, well, they, they might do, but that's not the main reason. Many monasteries were not very intellectual or whatever. Monks, M-O-N-K. Monks. People who decided to worship, this is not just in Christianity, many people decide when they feel very religious to kind of escape from the real world or from the secular world and uh, spend most of their time just contemplating, thinking about God or gods if they're polytheistic. And in Christianity, uh, many people eventually set up what we call monastic communities centered around a church where they would live and in theory spend all their lives there. Uh, copying manuscripts, praying, obviously, doing other things, uh, but not mixing very much with the rest of the society. In the Middle Ages, uh, before the Reformation, uh, and in some parts of Europe still after the Reformation, sort of monastic tradition was very important. Carolingians. This is Charlemagne, Charles the Great, and his uh, successors. Okay, they made a big impact recreating some kind of empire in Europe uh, and we'll look at not only the politics but also the cultural change and their contribution to uh, Western culture, very important. Then uh, we'll kind of look at two groups who uh, in various ways affected uh, European history, uh, well you could say positively or negatively depending on your uh, viewpoint. In history we don't usually make comments like that, say this was negative, we just say this is what happened and try and understand it. The Moors, which is the kind of European medieval-ish word for Islam, for Muslims, for the Arabs and so on. The effect of uh, the expansion of Islam in the Near East and Africa, uh, what happened in Europe, obviously very important. And then also my favourites, the Vikings. Okay, What those guys with the beards and the little pinty, pointy hats, which of course they didn't have, uh, and got up to and what they did and didn't do and so on there. Um, so uh, two groups there we'll look at. Then Kind of after that period, we're moving now into the 11th and 12th centuries, what we call here the feudal kingdoms. I should move this down a bit for the benefit of the people watching online. Um, so this is the uh, period after the decline of the Carolingians. We see new kingdoms, primarily what becomes France and what kind of becomes Germany uh, emerging in uh, Europe. Uh, and we'll look a little bit at what goes on in, in England as well because the... The Normans have a very big impact. Does anyone know who the Normans were, what they did, why they're important for British history? And Alp's not allowed to answer that question because he's done a whole course on medieval Britain with me. Anyone else? Who are the Normans? They're not men called Norman or anything. They're, they have another reason. Yeah, okay. Uh, they invaded Britain. Right. They came from France. They came from France. Ha ha, the French, oui oui. And what else? And then they invaded and they stayed and they became the new kings and so on. So the Anglo-Saxons, the Germanic guys, kind of lose the power and we get a bunch of Normans from France who were themselves originally Vikings but had kind of forgotten about that by this time, okay, take over. And uh, their king becomes uh, ruler, becomes king of England 
And then a little bit later, his uh, successors also take over large parts of France. So we have this empire ruled by the King of England, uh, stretching from southern France all the way up to uh, uh, what is now England, so uh, called the Angevins and so on. So we'll look a little bit about that, okay? Papacy reform and empire. During the same kind of period, so we're talking 11th, 12th, into the 13th centuries, we get people uh, discussing, for example, who has the most power and who is the closest to God and therefore who has power over whom. In Islamic tradition, the successors of the Prophet Muhammad okay, were both religious leaders and also were kind of military, political leaders, okay, uh, caliphs or sultans and so on. In Western Europe, in tr Christian tradition, you have a division. So you have political leaders who claim to be directly or, or politically at least de de descended from, coming from the Roman emperors and so on. Okay? And on the other hand, you have religious leaders, the church, and in the West, of course, it's the Pope in Rome at the top. And at certain points, the church and uh, the kings or the emperors say, I'm more important, no, I'm more important. Then we get arguments going on. And then sometimes the pope says, you can't be king anymore, or you can't go to church anymore. If you die, you'll go to hell and things like that. So during that period, there were lots of uh, debates, both, in fact, uh, by political writers, the theologians and so on about this issue, but we'll look more at the uh, practical side of those things. Of course, something else uh, very important, uh, the Crusades. Okay, um, a couple of years ago when I was teaching this course, uh, one of my students said, David, you know, uh, in our country, in our tradition or whatever, we see the Crusades as a very bad thing and as having a very, very bad effect on the Middle East. Uh, from the European perspective, kind of the Crusades was a kind of little thing. These guys went across to the Middle East, tried to get some land, succeeded for a while, then it all failed, and then we all forgot about it. Okay, that's kind of it. And we learned various things or whatever, but it, it doesn't directly, uh, in a big way, I would suggest, impact upon Western European history. We can consider that question as we go along. But uh, obviously a different perspective on, on what's going on if we look at it from this part of the world. So we can do a bit of that together as well. Then we'll look at, for two weeks, uh, society and economy in the High Middle Ages. We'll look at social structures and we'll focus then on rural society, the society in the countryside where, of course, most people lived. And then we'll spend some time looking at urban society. Urban means... Urbanism means... That's urbane, I suppose. If you add an E at the end, it would be civilized. Urban, if I refer to something as urban, what am I referring to? Cities, okay. Urbs in Latin and so on, okay. So countryside and then the cities, trade, manufacturing, and a little bit about the universities and so on. We'll, we'll see how we get on with those. Then we'll look at something which is the 14th century, kind of will begin before and stretch a bit after the 14th century, but various things I've called times of trouble here, things that had, uh, in one way or another, negative effects upon uh, uh, European society. The Hundred Years' War, when the King of England decided he was the King of France, and the King of France said, no, you're not, okay. Uh, the Great Schism, where one man said, I'm Pope, and then another man said, I'm Pope, and then another man said, I'm Pope. So you had all sorts of people being Pope. Black Death, of course, when lots of people end up dying uh, as well. So uh, look at all of those things, or some more in more details. Then some HTML mistake here. I can see the 13 should be down. Oh, I've got it twice. The Renaissance, the Renaissance. Okay. Uh, so good they named it twice. Um, and we'll finish off looking at the Renaissance and what that means. The big question for us to think about with that, I think, is... Is there, was the Renaissance um, something new and different? Did it have a different uh, characteristic from the previous period, uh, from the Middle Ages? Or was it something which just continued various medieval traditions and pointed forward to uh, the modern period as well? We can look at the nature of what we think the Renaissance uh, is. So that broadly is our scope. So we'll do some politics, we'll do some religion, we'll do some social history, we'll do some intellectual history, uh, and we might do a bit of uh, other things as well. Um, any questions? Is that all clear? Everyone okay with that? Think about those topics, because as I shall explain now, uh, everyone in this room, should you stay with the course and not drop it, 
uh, will have to give a presentation which fits in with this scheme, okay, with this sequence of topics. Okay, turn over the page, page two. And so, okay, they're in the wrong order there. Uh, you can come along and listen to my wise words every week and listen to what your friends have to say and hopefully laugh at some of my jokes. Uh, actually, definitely laugh at my jokes. The rest of it you can ignore. Um, but more importantly, of course, you're all thinking, okay, what am I going to be doing? What's going to be happening to me in the next 14 weeks? And am I going to get a nice grade? Okay. Um, let me make a, one point clear at the start. And for those of you at the graduate level, this is very important. But I think it's also quite important for um, the undergraduates to kind of grasp. Um, sometimes, when you take courses at university, uh, it probably feels a bit like a battle or a war, a savage. The teacher is giving lots of horrible things to make your life difficult and to push you down. And the students are just trying to find ways to avoid doing that work or whatever, OK? Um, for me, I want the same thing as all of you. For me, and I think this is what you all would like as well, I would be very happy uh, if I could give an A grade to every single person in this class. Now, the university administration might not be happy because they want to have uh, the lower common, common GPA and all that has got to be down at, at uh, C plus or B minus or something like that. But um, it would be my perfect day, uh, to uh, quote Lou Reed, if uh, I could give everyone an A because I felt you've worked hard, you've understood the material, you've laughed at my jokes, etc., etc., and you deserve that A, okay? And obviously, that's what you all would like as well. You would all like to get uh, a high grade A or whatever it would be. I give you work not to be an obstacle to try and force you not to get an A, okay, but to help me work out how good you are and whether you deserve the A. So ultimately, if we come with that mindset, if we realize that we want the same thing, which is a good grade, a successful course, then the important thing is that we work together. Okay? We work together on this. If you have a problem of any sort, if it's something to do with not coming to class, if it's something to do with not understanding an essay question, if it's something else, then let me know. Phone me, okay? send me an email, come and find me in the library, whatever it is, and we can work together to solve that problem. Okay? Um, and obviously, most importantly, in terms of the intellectual content, when I see you all at least once in the semester in my office to discuss your work, okay, I will give you feedback, hopefully constructive criticism to help you improve your work uh, and so on for the end of the semester. So if we begin with that kind of positive attitude, man, that we want the same thing, then I think we shall hopefully achieve good grades, OK? Um, I am also a fairly flexible kind of a teacher. I uh, should be careful what I say online, I suppose. But um, in terms of kind of having a bit extra time and things like that, I'm one of these people that says, here's the deadline. There are deadlines here. But if you need an extra couple of days, and if there's a good reason, I'll usually say yes. But that doesn't mean I'm giving you kind of carte blanche to uh, any excuse to miss the deadlines. You have to speak to me, you have to explain, and then again, we work together uh, for that aim. Okay? Tamama? Good? Yes? Right. So here are the three main things that you'll be doing for me in the next few weeks, apart from coming to class and laughing at my jokes. And they are as follows. Number one, and this is the difficult one because there's quite a lot of you in the class. Number one, presentations. Each student will be, will be required to give one oral presentation, which should take about 20, 25 minutes in length, and should provide an overview of the topic uh, which you have been assigned. Okay? And the list of topics and the subtopics are here. We will negotiate and discuss those uh, as we go along. Each week, you'll be given a short bibliography. On Friday in class, I will give you some material and I even maybe have put it on Moodle already. We can check afterwards uh, for next week. A bibliography of material relevant to the following week's topic or topics. Even if you have not given a presentation, you should try and do some reading. Okay, then it says C number three below. 
Uh, and probably that's kind of more or less what it says up there. Let's just focus on what we've got here for now. So, all of you will be required to speak about something relating to the 13 topics I gave. It doesn't mean you have to say, okay, next week, late Roman Empire and Germanic invasions, I'm going to talk about all of those things and cover everything. That's not too much, okay? We focus on a particular aspect of that week's topic. Okay, and then you will pick, talk with me a little bit, I'll give you some help, I'll give you some extra bibliography, whatever it might be, uh, look, check what you're doing, and then you'll give your presentation, you can use internet resources, PowerPoint, whatever it might be, if you think that's helpful, okay, uh, and you'll deliver that uh, to the class. Now that's the one part of the course that our friend at the back there, Emre, will not be recording. Okay, I've said yes, they can film me, okay, but obviously you may not be so comfortable with being videoed. Unless, of course, you want to, but I think we'll keep it as a general policy. When we have the presentations, Emre will switch those off or he will not uh, upload that part of the class uh, to, the, um, uh, to the internet in, in a few weeks' time, whenever it might be. Now, the problem I have is that there are 13 weeks, 14, 13 weeks, whatever, uh, okay, 13 topics, but we have 22, 23 people registered for the class, which even with my elementary and aged brain, uh, I can work out that we're going to have to have two presentations in some weeks. Okay? Sometimes we're going to have to have more than one presentation. Now, that's good for me, because it means I won't be speaking as much, okay? um, but it does mean there will be a certain amount of material, a certain amount of ideas we'll need to cover in our three hours together. And uh, if we have two presentations, uh, we'll have to negotiate quite carefully what you do, because I'll have to make sure we've done that, that, and that, and then I'll do the rest of it, or something like that. Plus, as you shall see soon, we need to do some reading, some discussion in class, and things like that. So there's a lot to squeeze in, in the weeks where we have two uh, presentations. Okay. So we need to uh, negotiate that. We cannot manage three. Three would be physically impossible if we had three presentations. I think that would be too much. Two presentations uh, definitely will be the maximum for many but not all of the weeks. Okay, any questions about that? Anyone a bit worried about giving a presentation? I should say, okay, at this point I should say again, uh, the class is very mixed. We have people who are new master's students or preparing to become master's students and I will be expecting absolutely fantastic, brilliant work from them, okay? And I shall be very hard on the grading. Well, maybe not so hard. But I shall be expecting a certain level of commitment and achievement from you. From those of you who are taking this as an elective, okay, I'm not saying you can be lazy. I'll be expecting good work from you. But obviously my standards will be a little bit different because you're a different cohort, a different group of students and so on. It still means we work together. It still means uh, you'll put time in. I'm not expecting just stuff from Wikipedia or something. We'll talk about that another time. Um, but Wikipedia is a very good resource, I should add, but uh, not the most intellectual one. Um, so I will treat different groups of students slightly differently. That's all I'm saying in terms of my expectations and so on. And that's not started to make the prepped people feel a bit uh, like that. Uh, don't worry, uh, we shall be fine. But the presentation, obviously, is something where some of you may feel a bit more comfortable uh, presenting and others may not, but we can work on that together. OK, any questions about this? We will, we will kind of um, partly do it week by week and partly you can let me know at any point. Okay? The way I've done it before is people have just come to me and said, OK, David, I really, really think that the Carolingians are amazingly interesting. I've always wanted to do the Carolingians. So I say, OK, we'll put you down for Carolingians. And then if someone else comes along uh, and does Carolingians, then the third person I'll say, no, sorry, it's all booked up. Okay, first come, kind of first served. Um, one of the things that does happen is people who aren't sure what they're doing or are trying to kind of delay work uh, for as long as possible end up saying, I want to do Renaissance because it's the last one. Okay? And then sometimes we get like a couple of not so good presentations about that. So let's not have that attitude. Okay? Really look through here and find out what you think might be interesting. 
Okay? And if you're interested in political history, we can find a political perspective for you. If you're interested in religious or social history, we can do that. You come and see, oh, I'd like to do this, David, but it's not here. Then I'll say, well, we can fit that in in this way. But you need to speak to me, and I'll keep, this will be my piece of paper, and gradually I'll keep the list. Okay? You, may not have, you don't have to decide today, but in the next week or so, I will be starting to say, look, the list is filling out. You need to let me know. Okay? Does that answer the question? Yes. But and I have one right, that's okay. I've got. Hang on, I've got a hair or something. Wait, 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 wait. There's a a hair was hanging down. I can't see. It. All right, is it gone? Oh yeah. Also, um, we're dark in here. If I do this during the summer, uh, they they diagnose I have a small cataract on this left on my right. It's not very big, that kind of thing. But they said you need to have these special glasses that become dark. Uh, because it's the sunlight in Turkey that's doing it. So now when I'm kind of walking outside, I go like this. And I'm not, I'm not a sort of sunglasses kind of a guy. So if you see me walking around or if I come into class quickly, I'll have sunglasses, but they'll fade eventually. But that was the hair or something. Sorry, again, question. You said that the topics are broad and we need to focus on specific maybe. Yes. How will you decide on this? I mean, according to the syllabus or come and talk to you in person? Yeah, talk to me, and you'll say, okay, I mean, for, oh, let's take. Is there anything there in general? You've circled two things, I see already. Yeah, I okay. want to take social structure and society and agree on economy. Right, okay, well, that's very, very big. I mean, that's the whole society in the 13th century or something. So then we would talk, and we might, we might just put your name down now. That would be enough. But nearer the time, then we might, you might say, well, I want to look at... Uh, peasantry. I want to look at what it was like to be a peasant in that time, or I want to look at the manorial system or something, or I want to do something really physical about agriculture. We can see. And then I'll say yes or no, and then we can focus on that. Okay? Bashka, yes? Uh, how we do the readings? I mean, there are lots of sources, but... You know, no, 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 look at that page. I haven't got to that page yet. What are you doing? I'll come to that page in a minute. Okay, I'll explain that one in a minute. Okay? No, no, that's fair enough. I will give you bibliography each week. I'll explain about that in a minute. Okay? Any other questions? No? Fatih? You can either come to the class knowing nothing. I know nothing. You know, um, anyone seen Faulty Towers? You know Faulty Towers? It's a 1970s British comedy about this um, uh, crazy guy who runs a hotel. He has this supposed Spanish guy who's the waiter. I know nothing, he's saying. I think. You can come knowing nothing. Okay? You can turn up with knowing nothing about rural society in the late Middle Ages or something. And then you can just listen to me and... Was it Elif or... No, no. Your name? Elif, yes. You can listen to me and Elif, for example, talking about it. Then you'll go away and you'll learn. But to maybe get more out of the class, to maybe think that you've learned a little bit more, if you read a little bit in advance, okay, then that might help you to get more out of what I'm saying. Okay? If you come with a blank brain, we have to put everything in. If you come with some knowledge, you're in a position to say, ah, David, but I think you're wrong, or I said this, or I think that, or what about this, and, and so on. So it's not compulsory. I'll tell you about the compulsory stuff in a minute. It's just, if you've got an hour or so to, to go to the library and read something, I think that would help. Okay? This is part of the thing that graduates should do. When I was a graduate student, I was a good boy. Okay? I used to do all the reading and things like that. Um, but obviously, you're all very busy and so on. So some weeks you can, maybe some weeks you can't. Okay? Any other questions? Right, um, next thing, so that's presentations, which we have to sort out somehow in the next week or so. Essays. The course will require two essays from every student. The first to be, here's our first deadline, the first to be submitted on Friday the 18th of November. And no one go on their iPhone now and say, wait a minute, David, the 18th of November isn't Friday. Just check in case I've got that wrong or something, okay? And the second is Friday uh, also, the 6th of January. I think that's our last day of class. So the second one in especially, I will be flexible about because we've got a certain period, exam period coming up and so on. So that's just the last day of class, but we can, we can negotiate the second essay a bit more. Okay? But there is about seven weeks between each essay. Don't go and think, oh, seven weeks, fantastic. That means I don't have to do anything for about six and a half weeks or whatever, okay? Because, as I said, I'm expecting good work and I will be 
asking you about your work at various points. So uh, you need to start thinking about the topics you're interested in and what you'd like to write your essay on. I'll talk a bit more about essays in detail on Friday. I'll bring you uh, a little guide and so on. But uh, the sooner you start things, the sooner you can get into it, the better it will be. Okay. Um, as I sometimes say to my undergraduate students when I teach undergraduate courses, there is a, it's a kind of disease which exists in Bill Kent called last minuteism. And it means that everything gets done at the last minute, okay? Uh, and it's obviously a terrible sort of viral thing. It spreads through the human student body very quickly. Uh, now, I know you're all very busy. You've got lots of courses to do. You've got lots of pressure from the nasty teachers as well as the nice ones. Um, but the sooner you start something, the sooner you start to think about something, in my opinion, then uh, the better it's going to be. And you can come to me with any problems. You can start preparing. Who knows what might happen? You might really become sick or something, and then at the last minute you can't do it, and so on. So I will be pushing you to think about your topics in the next week or so. Okay. The purpose of this exercise, the purpose of the essays, is to train you in the basic skills of writing history. Again, that's why I'm focusing on the prep people in particular, okay? as well as to learn something about medieval Europe. Therefore, the first essay will be what I've called here a kind of trial run. So uh, you'll all write an essay for me by 18th of November, and that deadline is less flexible. okay? And then, I shall get together at some point with every one of you for 10, 15 minutes in my history office over a period of about a week, and I shall say, Elif, that was fantastic essay. Here's an A. I've got no criticism. I'll say, uh, Alp, that was OK, but I suggest you do. Oh, I'm not, I'm not picking on either of you. I'm just saying. OK, I'll give you some constructive feedback about not just the content. I'm not going to say that's the wrong date or something like that. I'm not worrying about that. But the way you put your essay together, the way you quote sources, the way you construct your arguments and things like that. Okay? Trying to work on the ways that historians approach material and then synthesize it into uh, some kind of a, a coherent argument. So that's the kind of trial run. And as you see below there, the first essay will be worth 20% of the final grade. Okay? Uh, well, the first you may encounter will hopefully be avoided in the second essay. Okay, then you write the second essay, and the second essay hopefully will be better. Okay, uh, because you'll have learned what mistakes you may or may not have made. You'll have taken my feedback and comments on board, and you'll start working earlier, whatever it might be. And the second essay will therefore be better, and therefore I give that one uh, forty percent, double the points. Okay. Uh, now, this doesn't mean you have to be lazy and do no work for the first one. They're all very important, and I'll be keeping a, a careful track on that. But in terms of developing the skills, the ways of thinking, the ways of working, and so on, okay, this is the kind of logic behind why, why I do that. And as I said, on hopefully on Friday, if we have time, I shall start talking a little bit about the essays. I shall give you a couple of a selection of questions. You'll have a choice. You can come up with your own topic and your own question, your own problem, or else you can pick from a list that I will give you, and you can, uh, you can do that, and I will help you with bibliography uh, either way, and so on. OK, any questions there? Anyone a bit nervous? Essay writing, obviously, is very, very important for graduate students, historians, but I think also uh, it's an important um, element in uh, being a student in general, the way you work, research, focus, synthesize, as I said, and then kind of put it all together. Um, I haven't decided yet whether to use something called turn it in. Does anyone know what that is? Have you ever heard of turn it in before? Something we pay lots of money for through the library. It's a plagiarism detection software, okay, which I do use when I teach history civilization to first year undergraduates because we do get a little bit more of the cut and paste from the internet, search Google, go to Wikipedia kind of a thing, or Hodjam, I don't know how to write English, I'm only a first year, and, and so on, so then they cut and paste, whatever. Obviously, you are all older students, so um, I don't want to kind of insult you almost and say I don't trust you 
or whatever that might be. And people do find uh, having to submit their essays to turn it in sometimes uh, a kind of a negative experience or whatever. So I, I shall think about that. Uh, maybe we'll see how the first essay goes. And if I have many cases of plagiarism or whatever, then I might uh, institute turn it in for the second essay or something like that. And please, uh, most importantly, if anyone is thinking of getting their wallets out and going to um, another place and getting someone to write their essay for them, which does happen occasionally, don't do that as well. I want your work, I want your ideas, and however good they are, however bad they are, if it's your thoughts and your approach, then you'll actually get fairly good grade, and then we'll work on the problems together. Okay? And again, any issues to do with these things or writing an essay, please let me know, and then we can uh, work on it together. Okay, participation. This is coming back to the point that uh, Fatih was saying before. Um, for each weekly topic, so for all of these 13 or so weeks that we have here, I will assign in advance a relevant primary source. What is a primary source? What does that mean? One of the most important things for an historian. Primary source. Well, uh, yes and no. Um, primary there doesn't mean main, it means something a little bit more. First account? Could you want to expand on that one? Explain a bit further, first account? Like, uh, I don't know, uh, someone who wrote about what they've seen or experienced. Yeah, okay, it means as close as we can get to what really happened in the past, okay? I've just brought along, just to show off, I don't know, I just brought a couple of books here, okay? These are both what we call secondary books. They're both textbooks, basic accounts of medieval Europe. They are uh, secondary sources, okay? And you'll be using a lot of these things to prepare your essays and so on. Primary sources are the original documents written uh, in the past. Some of them closely connected to the events they're describing. Others, they may be a few years uh, later or whatever, but they're still from the past, okay? And what we're going to do is we're going to read, or you will read, and then together we will discuss um, this primary source. And they'll be relevant to these topics. They'll be connected to the topics we have there, okay? It's 4.30, we can hear kind of hordes of Germanic barbarians outside, but I'm not going to let you go away soon. Uh, we'll wait for a little bit. I've got a few more things to do, then we'll finish a little bit early. So we won't have two hours. We'll do a bit more than one hour, and we start a bit late as well because we came here. So don't start getting nervous or looking at your watches. Another 10, 15 minutes, and then we shall escape for today. Um, so each week I shall put probably scan or find a, an HTML version or something on Moodle. Most of them hopefully will be online. So you will go to the Moodle page. So we have to work on making sure Moodle works in the next uh, uh, week or so. And uh, you will download or read online the text. You will then come and be prepared to discuss that in class. Okay? And I'll have some questions about the text, what it means, what it's trying to do, and again, how do historians approach documents and so on. And I'll be expecting most of you to have some idea. Okay? And if by the end of the semester, by the time I know most people's names, if I've realized that so-and-so has never said anything, never contributed at all to the discussion, then obviously I shall take that into account when determining your participation grade, which we have there. So it says, you should definitely absolutely read this material and if possible some of the bi bibliography I mentioned in number one so that goes back to the point before to help you understand it and be prepared to discuss it in class the following week your participation in the, the discussion will be assessed as I just said okay so the main points presentation which is 30% uh, essay 1 20% uh, essay 2 40% attendance and participation together Okay, will be about 10%, all right? Any questions there? Anything not clear? Okay, so we go now to the last page, number three, which, um, what well, was your name again? Well, Mustafa was worrying about a little bit earlier. Um, what have I said here? Most general works on medieval Europe in the library are assigned uh, according to the Library of Congress system, LC system. They're in the library D102 and to D103. 
uh, 2.03. We'll go to the library, have a little look around the library on Friday and the second hour. Um, it says also see CB351 to 355. And let's, I think this is up, isn't it, now? We have to go up for this, this thing up there, okay? Um, and then I've given a list below. Following books are general books dealing with all or most of the period covered in this course. So the following list are just some very, very general books about medieval Europe or early medieval Europe or me Europe in the late Middle Ages or something like that. Okay? Um, for every week, I will give you an additional extra bibliography of specific things which will have some material or absolutely lots of material about that topic. So on Friday, I will give you a bibliography, and I'll put it on Moodle as well, which uh, tells you about the late Roman Empire or about the Germanic barbarians or about both of them. Okay? Uh, some or all of these books you can also use for that as well. Here is my suggested approach. If you're not familiar with this material, if you have absolutely no familiarity with late Roman Empire, Germanic barbarians, feudal kingdoms in the 12th century, whatever it might be, um, I suggest a good way is to look first at a chapter in one of the general books. So something listed here, or something also between D102 to 203, or CB351 to 355, that part of the library. Go and find a general book, look in the content, see if they've got a chapter about late Roman Empire, something like that. These books and similar ones will have very, very general basic information. So you can read that, take some notes, obviously, and feel you've got some understanding of what's going on. Then, after you've done that, You can look at the more specialized books that I give you, or you can look for some articles in journals that deal with a particular topic. In my experience, when I cast my mind back to when I was a first and undergraduate student studying history, now I'm 40, I'm almost 40, I'll be 47 in just over a month's time. Um, so I was a student almost 30 years ago. That's kind of scary prospect, isn't it? Oh, dear. Um, but anyway, uh, back in those golden days of the early 1980s when people wore strange clothes and things, and I was at university, sometimes I would try and read the specialist material first. I don't want to waste time. I want to get down. And it was just too much. I couldn't understand all the names and the information. Start with something quite general. Pick it from this list or elsewhere. If one of these books is borrowed by someone else, you can find another one. Okay? So I'm not expecting you to read every single book here. This is just a, a selection of general books. Pick one or two of these, read the relevant chapter or chapters that will give you a broad overview of the topic, and then you're in a good position to then step into the deep end of the intellectual pool and start to read a little bit more about what was actually going on for your particular topic. Okay, So that's why I've got this list here. That's why um, I put it here and there's a version online, or else I give you the call numbers in the library. Browse around, start general, and then begin to focus in. Okay? And if you have any problems, if you can't find any of these books, because everyone else has borrowed one of them from the library, send me an email, and we can always check in my office if I've got one that you can borrow for a week or something like that. Okay? So this is not the list of books you must read in the next 15 weeks. The things you must read will be coming uh, in following weeks, and you won't have to read all of those either. But if I give you lots of stuff, you've got things to choose from. And this is the general material that you can refer to when you're starting your essay or you're beginning to prepare your presentation and you need a background, uh, a broad picture of what the uh, topic was. OK. Any questions about that? Anything not clear? OK, so um, I think we can stop there. We've done just over, it's about an hour or just under an hour. We shall meet again in here on um, 
Friday. I should send an email, because I think there's like one or two people who didn't come, so I should send an email to make sure the others know we're here. Tell them to come to this room, okay? If you see anyone around you know, and you're saying, oh, you weren't there, you can explain as well what's going on. Um, on Friday, we shall do a number of things. I want to talk a little bit more about what, hi what is history, the most fundamental question. I haven't even done that yet because we've only had this one hour today. I want to talk a little bit about what the Middle Ages were, or what I think the Middle Ages were, maybe get some of your thoughts about what the word medieval means. We shall also say a little bit more about the essay writing, I hope, and then, depending on time, as I said, we might go to the library. Hands up, particularly the prep students, I think, because everyone else is Bill Kent student. Hands up those of you who are not Bill Kent graduates. Hands up those of you who are from uh, elsewhere, okay. So, you in particular, you may have been to the library, I don't know yet, you may not have been to the library, so I'll take you around, we'll have a little look around where the history books are, familiarise you with those, and the others can come along as, if you want as well, or you can obviously go off, we'll, we'll talk about that on Friday. Okay, have a nice two days, any questions, any problems, see me now, or send me in the, oh, oh, before you go, question here. No, 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 this is the first week, so uh, nothing to prepare for Friday, just general thoughts and ideas and things like that. Okay, any other questions, let me know by email, come and find me, or come and see me now, we'll, uh, we'll chat now.